just to echo kind of what you were saying with Jesus, um, Buddha did not claim to be the Son of God or God incarnate. He said, follow my teaching, my Dharma. Look to my teaching. Confucius, Aristotle, these guys were not claiming to be God in the flesh, but they were incredibly influential people. So you got two lists of people that I'm thinking of. On one list, you got the most influential people in human history. And Jesus, nobody can argue, Jesus is on the list of the top ten, top five, maybe top three. I mean, we date our calendar around his birth, 2013, since Jesus was born. So you got the most influential people in human history on one list. And then on the other list, you've got people who claim they were God. And that's like the Charles Manson list. These are like crazy, mixing the Kool-Aid, let's get everyone to go drink poison and end up on Haley's Comet or something, you know. So you got this list of people who, are, who claim to be God, and they're all crazy people. And then you got people over here who are the most influential people on the planet. Only one guy is on both lists. Jesus both claimed to be God and is one of the most influential people in human history. You think we shouldn't give that guy a second look? Maybe the guy we date our calendar around actually was who he claimed to be, God in the flesh, who's changing human history, has, more, has had more of an effect on mankind than any other single person ever. It makes sense. That might be the guy who said he was. Who said, he might actually be who he claimed to be, which is God in the flesh. So Jesus, you're right. It all rests on the shoulders of who Jesus Christ was of Nazareth. If you lose the Trinity, believe it or not, you lose a whole lot with it. Uh, if God is not three in one, then God at His essence is not a God in loving relationship forever. So if, if you believe in, in Islam, if you just have a monotheistic, singular person God, just God by Himself, one person, then for all of eternity, who was God loving before He created us? Who was God in relationship before He created us? No one. And a loving relationship can't exist without at least two different people. And if God is only one person, then there is no love until God creates us, which means power precedes love. And power is more at, at essence of the, of the universe than love is. But in Christianity, you have a trinity. Three persons, one God. A loving father is at God's very nature. God doesn't become a loving father when he creates us. He is forever a loving father in perfect, loving relationship with his son by the spirit. And that means at God's essence is love and community diversity and unity and every single coin in the United States says e pluribus unum on it out of the many one the word university in the University of Georgia means unity and diversity we're all about unity different races and classes and, and economic backgrounds what is that longing doing in our hearts for unity and diversity it's, it's in us because it came from our first cause God himself has unity and diversity in the community of the Trinity and that's where we get that longing in all of us. So the very desire for love and commitment and relationship comes from God's essence in the Trinity. Lose the Trinity, lose community, and lose love at the heart of, uh, of existence. Um, why did God sin, allow sin into the world slash why do bad things happen? Giving a slightly kind of new perspective maybe. Um, it, our culture loves movies and we love good stories and we love to read good fiction and good books and every single story contains basically three components here. You've got conflict introduced early on and then you've got a climax where it looks like evil's about to win and oftentimes the good guy at the very last second at great cost to himself defeats evil and rescues someone from danger and then the end you've got the um, the resolution, which is happily ever after in a lot of stories. Every good story has conflict, evil, difficulty, obstacles. Uh, and that doesn't make Shakespeare a bad writer because he put difficulty into his plays. And that doesn't make God uh, a bad God because he put difficulty into this world. We're, we, we need to overcome obstacles. And ultimately, uh, the story of the gospel is the greatest story. It's not fiction. It is true. And in that story, there is difficulty and there is conflict and there is sin. And God comes in and at the moment where it looks like he's defeated on the cross where he's dying, at that moment he actually overcomes evil. I mean, just think about this. In the movie The Avengers that came out a while back, you've got at the end of the movie, Iron Man takes the nuclear weapon away from Chicago and basically gives his life to save the city. And everyone loves that movie. Dark Knight Rises, he takes the nuke outside over the ocean and basically it looks like he's going to give his life to save the city. That's in so many stories that our culture loves. And God is writing the true myth, is what Lewis called it. The true story, which is that he defeats evil, he overcomes obstacles, and if we trust in him, even death itself will turn into victory in the resurrection. So God is an author. He's writing a story. Every good story has conflict and difficulty, and through the cross he himself overcomes that difficulty by being overcome by it himself. And so 
God is not a bad God, he's a good God, and he's writing this story. So, I'm assuming you two would claim to be Christians. That's right. At least I would. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> what makes your truth claim any more valid than a Buddhist, a Muslim, a Hindu? How do you have exclusivity in your truth claim? Well, first of all, it's not our exclusivity. It was a statement by Jesus Himself. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Me. Jesus Himself claimed to be the only way to God. And the reason He is the only way to God is He's the only one who bridged the gap between us and God by dying for our sins. All other religions outside of Christianity are a works approach to God. It's a man approach to God. It's us living up to a set of rules or code or ethics. Christianity is God reaching us in Jesus Christ. It's totally based on grace, not works, because Jesus Christ is the only one who paid the divine price for our sin and shedding His blood. It's closer to us, yeah, but we're still. Let me just add: a lot of people on, on this campus, and I, I have a tendency here. We don't believe in absolute truth. And how dare you say you're right and I'm wrong? That's arrogant. That's judgmental. Yeah, except in math class. In math class, there is such a thing as a right and a wrong answer, and we know it. And when we get when we get two plus two equals five, guess what the teacher says? Wrong answer, you lose points. And that's not because they're arrogant or better than me. It's because they're holding to a, a standard of truth that is objectively true. Two plus two equals four, and only four, nothing else. And so well, there is such a thing as real truth, and it's not arrogant to hold to it. It's humility. It's just saying that's what's real. I believe it. And correcting someone who's 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 in the wrong in math class is not arrogant. And I would say it's the same thing even with our worldviews. There is such a thing as objective truth. And if you say, no, there is no objective truth, then that's an objective truth claim. So everybody believes in objective truth. You can't get away from it. Even when people say, I, there are no absolutes. Are you absolutely sure? Yes, okay, that's an absolute statement denying that there are absolutes. So everybody believes that there is such a thing as right and wrong. So uh, there, there is such a thing as objective truth. I'm more than happy to say I don't know, too. You're claiming that there's some deity in the sky that's responsible for us. You have a fantastic claim, and you don't have no even close enough evidence to even get us to consider its validity. Okay, I, th I think that actually Darwinian kind of atheistic evolution makes an even more fantastic claim than, than Christianity. The, the idea, and I know not every atheist believes this, but a lot of, a lot of the, probably a lot of you do believe this. Th th here's the claim. The uni everyone listen to this. The universe was created by nothingness. That's a fantastic claim that cannot be proven and violates all the laws of science, physics, and philosophy. You know what nothing does? Nothing does nothing. All the time, every day, all day long. Nothing is what your teeth see, only less. Uh, this, is a claim, uh, uh, this is a claim a lot of people will make, okay? Nothing is what sleeping rocks dream about, but less. That, and a lot of people will claim that's the thing that created the universe. The universe came from nothingness. That is a fantastic claim that violates uh, philosophy, science, and all the laws that we understand. That, that is ridiculous. There's no, that, that's greater than a miracle. Nothing creating something. If you heard an explosion outside your dorm this afternoon, and you went out to see what the explosion was, how insane would you have to be to think the explosion was caused by nothing? You're, in, you're, you're crazy if you think nothing causes explosions. Big bangs don't come from nothing. They come from something much greater than the explosion, which would be, in this case, God. Something eternal outside of time. Something more powerful than every atomic explosion that could be caused by any particle exploding in this universe. Something more powerful, understanding beauty and morality and all these different things. That makes sense that the universe would come from an all-loving, all-knowing God rather than from a nothingness. Here, here try, to get, try to understand nothing. Nothing is, think of a, think of a glass. Now empty the glass out. Now get rid of the glass and the table it's sitting on. Now part the particles that are sitting there to where now it's just the cold, empty vacuum of space. Now step into that and get rid of the cold, get rid of the vacuum, and get rid of the space, get rid of yourself, get rid of God, get rid of disease, get rid of physicality, potentiality, causation, get rid of all that, and then, then, then subtract from that anything else you can think of. That's nothing. Nothing doesn't do anything. Here, you want another example of nothing? Oh, pick up a book that's called, it's about, let's say it's a book called Everything Mice Talk About. Pick up that book, look at the cover. You see the cover? Now open to page negative 77. That's nothing. You're saying that created us? That created your eyeball? That created the intelligent brain that you got in your head? That is ridiculous. That is silly. That's just silly. You know it's not true. Everybody knows nothing does nothing all the time. Never did anything. Can't. Nothing is nothing. No, something brought into existence this universe. Everything that has a beginning, 
has a cause. You had a beginning and you had a cause, your parents. Same with them. The universe, I think, had, an, had a beginning, very possibly in the Big Bang. What caused the universe to start? It had to be something outside of time, eternal, something with immense power and an immense sense of beauty. And that sounds like God to me. Why aren't more people reaching the same conclusion? I, I, I like a lot of what Mark said about how unique the Bible is from other religious documents. For me personally, the, the internal consistency of the Bible, the credibility of the historical record, over and over and over again, archaeological, intellectual, scientific evidence supports the Bible. And then really the issue is Jesus Christ. I mean, that's the bullseye in all of our discussion today. We can differ on this, that, and the other, but Jesus Christ claimed to be God in human form. He claimed to be the only way to God, and we've got to reckon with that claim. And I think C.S. Lewis's argument was profound years ago when he said either he's a Lord God, who he claimed to be, he's a liar, he truly lied about who he was, or he's a lunatic. He thought he was the Son of God, but he was schizophrenic. It's not conceivable that he was just a prophet or just a good man because he claimed to be the only way to God. And so for me personally, with all these arguments, all these questions, all these things that maybe we can't fully reconcile in our own mind, for me the issue is Jesus Christ. And the evidence for his life, death, and resurrection is so overwhelming that to me that is the place to anchor your faith and anchor your life.